be imminent. Secret History looks at killer flu. People didn't want to believe that they could be healthy in the morning and dead by nightfall. They didn't want to believe that. It was the worst epidemic the world has ever known. It attacked over a billion people, more than half the Earth's population. It was a phantom, and we didn't know where it was. In a gradual, remorseless way, it kept moving closer and closer. But you never knew from day to day who was going to be next on the death list. There were so many people dying that you ran out of things that you'd never considered running out of before, caskets. It killed an estimated 40 million people, and yet it's hardly remembered. That for me is, is the greatest mystery, how we could have forgotten anything so horrendous, so massively horrendous uh, as, as this, this epidemic, which killed so many of us, killed us so fast, and our reaction was to forget it. Nineteen eighteen, Middle America, a life far removed from the tragedy and bloodshed in Europe. But soon that life and the life of nations everywhere was about to be shattered, not by war, but by a disease, influenza. This film is about how it affected one nation, the United States. America was hit no harder than anywhere else, but it was the country where the flu first appeared, from where it spread, and where its course is most thoroughly documented. On March the 9th, 1918, at Fort Riley Army Camp in Kansas, there was, as the soldiers later came to see it, an omen. They'd burned tons of manure, and a gale kicked up. A stinking yellow haze swept over the land, and the sun went black. Two days later, Though no medical connection was ever suggested, an army private reported to the camp hospital before breakfast. He had a fever and complained of a sore throat and a headache. A minute later, another soldier showed up. By noon, the hospital had over a hundred cases. In a week, 500. That spring, 48 fit young soldiers died at Fort Riley. The disease surfaced at other army camps and was diagnosed as pneumonia. In fact, it was the first appearance of a virulent new strain of flu. I think all the evidence points to this virus originating in the United States. But of course, how can we be sure? How can we be sure that 18 months before 1918, uh, an immigrant from China may have come in there carrying the virus? We can't be sure. But as things stand at the moment, it does look as though the outbreak had its origin in an army camp in the United States. Then the mysterious new disease went dormant. But six months later, on a rainy day in September, Dr. Victor Vaughan, acting Surgeon General of the United States Army, received urgent orders to proceed to a base near Boston called Camp Devons. Camp Devons would change Dr. Vaughan's world forever. I saw hundreds of young stalwart men in uniform coming into the wards of the hospital. Every bed was full, yet others crowded in. The faces wore a bluish cast. A cough brought up the blood-stained sputum. On the day Vaughan arrived, 
63 men died at Camp Devons. The cancer sickness had found a new home. An autopsy revealed lungs that were swollen, filled with fluid, and strangely blue. Doctors were finally able to identify the disease as an old and familiar one, influenza, but of a form unlike any seen before. One of the factors that made this so particularly frightening was that everybody had a preconception of what the flu was. It's a miserable cold, and after a few days, you're up and around. This was a flu that put people into bed as if they'd been hit with a two by four, that turned into pneumonia, that turned people blue and black and killed them. It was uh, a, uh, a flu out of uh, some sort of a horror story. They never had dreamed that influenza could ever do anything like this to people before. Soldiers carried the disease from one military base to the next. They did it simply by breathing. If an individual with influenza were standing in front of a room full of people coughing, each cough would carry millions of particles with disease-causing organisms into the air. All the people breathing that air would have an opportunity to inhale a disease-causing organism. It doesn't take very long for one case to become 10,000 cases. The more people there are together, the bigger chance the virus has of spreading from person to person. So any situation uh, which encourages mobility of people would encourage the virus to spread. And of course, in 1918, there was fantastic mobility. The cause of that mobility was war. During the summer and autumn of 1918, a million and a half American soldiers crossed the Atlantic to Europe. And with them, they brought the flu. The new American recruits then came in contact with British soldiers, with French soldiers, all the same age, all living in overcrowded conditions, in the camps, and on the Western Front, of course, the conditions were, were extremely poor in general, but very nice for viruses like influenza to spread. And so I think possibly in a rather subterranean way, without anyone quite realize what was, what, realizing what was happening, the virus was seeding itself in the trenches. As it spread through the trenches, the virus mutated, becoming stronger and deadlier. And as soldiers returned to all corners of the earth, they took the virus with them. My first intimations about the epidemic were that it was something that was happening to the troops. There didn't seem to be any reason to think that it would ever, ever have anything to do with us. And, and yet, uh, in a gradual, remorseless way, it kept moving closer and closer. On September the 11th, 1918, on the sidewalks of Quincy, Massachusetts, three civilians dropped dead. From Boston, the disease traveled down the eastern seaboard to New York, to Philadelphia, and across to the small town of Lincoln in Illinois. Rumors of this alarming situation had reached this very small town of 12,000 people in the Middle West. I know that my parents were worried. I, I, I paid less attention to their words than I did to the sounds of their voices, and when they discussed it, I heard anxiety. My mother was expecting a baby, and so my father and mother had no choice but to take me to my father's sister's house, where we were not comfortable. It was a dark, gloomy house. I can best suggest the quality of the house by saying in the living room there was a framed photograph of my grandfather in his coffin. It was a very strange room. There was a vase with peacock feathers in it, and my aunt didn't know, I don't know that anybody else in Lincoln knew uh, that peacock feathers bring bad luck.
The first time that I was aware that something was amiss in our normal living was when my father told me, son, most of the employees are sick. We don't have anyone left to run the store. Everyone is homesick or in the hospital sick. And within a week or 10 days, my father told me that uh, this sales lady had passed away and another one had passed away. So as I recall, out of the eight or 10 employees, four of them passed away and the passing away came about so quickly. It was a mild day and we were sitting on the step diagonally across from us. There was a little, a girl, 15 year old girl was just buried towards the evening. We heard a lot of screaming going on. And in that same house, a little baby, 18 months old, passed away in that same family. For a physician, it must have been very, very confusing being confronted with patients that come to you and within uh, 12 hours before you even have a chance to do anything, they're dead. This was happening too fast. Even children began to see it coming. A little ditty was heard in the playgrounds. I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and in flew Enza. I had a little bird. But the flu was only just beginning. From mid-September 1918, the flu epidemic began to sweep throughout the world. In America, as elsewhere, officials didn't realize the growing threat. Royal Copeland, the health commissioner of New York City, announced, the city is in no danger of an epidemic, no need for our people to worry. New York would let things take their own course. The first reaction of the authorities for many of the most important ones, was just flat out denial. They didn't know what was happening, they didn't know what to do, and therefore they did the human thing, which is to say it's not happening. The federal authorities in America called 13 million young men to register for the draft. The men jammed together in schools, city halls, post offices, and they breathed on each other and infected each other. There were two enormously important things going on at once, and they were at right angles to each other. One, of course, was the influenza epidemic, which dictated that you should sort of shut everything down, and the war, which demanded that everything should speed up, that certainly the factories should continue uh, operating, you should continue to have bond drives, uh, soldiers should be put on boats and sent off to France. It's as if we could, as a society, only contain one big idea at a time, and the big idea was the war. With winning the war the priority, huge crowds turned out for parades supporting Liberty Loan drives. In Philadelphia, 200,000 people massed in the streets. They linked arms and sang patriotic songs, all the while spreading the infection. In the days that followed, the flu ripped into Philadelphia like a tidal wave. Harriet Ferrell's family lived in Brooklyn Street. It was really a terrible experience for the people. It was so many people sick. In our household, it was the four of us in bed, and my uncle and aunt on the third floor apartment with their son. So my mother was caring for seven sick people in our home. I was a skinny little boy with an enormous appetite. Just as my plate was put in front of me, I felt no desire for food. My aunt put her hand on my forehead and uh, got up from the table and took me upstairs and put me to bed because I had a high fever. And I think what happened was that I slept and slept and slept and slept.
no one knew what was causing the epidemic. It was open season for all sorts of lurid speculation. There were rumors that ran rampant of all types and sizes. And one of the rumors I remember very explicitly was that the Germans had planted the germs for the spread of influenza. The flamboyant evangelist, Billy Sunday, thought the cause was as simple as sin. We can meet here tonight and pray down the epidemic, Sunday said. But even as he spoke, people in the audience collapsed with the flu. One agonized official in the stricken east sent an urgent warning west. Hunt up your woodworkers, he wrote, and set them to making coffins. Then take your street laborers and set them to digging graves. The flu was now moving into small towns, deep in the heart of the country. Lee Ray was living in Meadow, Utah. We were very concerned in our town because it was moving south down the highway and we were next. My father was selected as the health officer. We had never had a health officer in our town before, but uh, we felt now that we needed one, and so my dad went out to the city limits signs, and I went with him, and we put a sign that said, this town is quarantined, do not stop. So we had purposely isolated ourselves but it wasn't enough. The disease came anyway. The mailman brought it. You can't barrier yourself from being exposed because the person who looks healthy may be spreading the disease. And that was part of the horror. We can't get away from respiratory diseases of other people because we all have to breathe. In Denver, Colorado, Catherine Ann Porter, a young journalist, had fallen in love with an army lieutenant. Their romance was cut short after she became sick. Soon she was delirious, but Porter's dashing young lieutenant stayed by her side. He was so patient with me those nights when I was sick getting me things, and always just sitting there. When I would wake up, he would be there. Her fever rose so high that her hair turned white and then fell out. There was only that pain, only that room. There was only this one moment, and it was a dream of time. I remember that time was a blur as I was lying in that little upstairs room and uh, I would wake up and it would be daylight and I'd wake up the next time I woke up it would be dark and it might be dark when I woke up it might be daylight I had no sense of day and night and uh, I felt sick and hollow inside. Hospitals overflowed. Emergency relief centers sprang up in parks and playgrounds. But practically every available doctor and nurse had been sent to Europe. The ones who remained were asked to perform the impossible. Near Chicago, a young nurse, Josie Mabel Brown, arrived at Great Lakes Naval Station. She was promptly assigned a ward with 42 beds. And she walked into the ward, and not only were the 42 beds full, but there were boys that were laying on the floors and on the stretchers, waiting for that boy in the bed to die. The epidemic was now a crisis, not only in America, but throughout the world. Europe, Africa, India, Asia. 
Britain. The records from the East End of London begin to show what happens in, in Britain in 1918, and you can open up the book from the children's hospital, not so far from here, and you can suddenly see from the book the number of children dying in hospital with influenza pneumonia. A public information film was produced to advise the British people of the dangers. A Dr. Wise related the cautionary tale of a Mr. Brown, who instead of staying in bed when he got the flu, insisted on going to work, where he infected his colleagues. Altogether, it's reckoned that half the world's population, a billion people, caught the virus. Once the virus drifted into your nose and seeded itself in your body, the virus would replicate, would, would infect your cells, and you wouldn't notice it for 24 hours, and then suddenly the symptoms would come roaring in. You'd feel feverish, have a raging headache, you'd have aches and pains all over your body. You'd just feel that something awful had hit you. And then in the ensuing three, four, five days, you just have to sweat it out. And more often than not, of course, they sweated it out and after about five or six days they began to feel better and so they emerged, they got up and they recovered. Those would be the majority of people infected. But in a minority, they didn't get up. The, the infection did not resolve itself. In fact, it got worse. And what would be happening is that the virus would be moving down deeper into the respiratory tract, into the lung tissue, dividing and destroying the cells, lining the air sacs in the lung. And those particular individuals, they were going to die. It uh, filled up the lungs with, uh, with fluid. And so these people, uh, these people drowned. Uh, only they didn't drown in the Atlantic Ocean, they drowned in their own fluids. In America, Officials in nearly every major city rushed through laws requiring people to wear masks in public. The whole country, it seemed, put on masks. At last, many thought, they were safe. But masks didn't help. They were thin and porous no serious restraint for tiny microbes. It was like trying to keep out dust with chicken wire. In Washington, D.C., Commissioner Lewis Brownlow banned all public gatherings. He closed the city's schools, theaters, and bars. He quarantined the sick. He did everything he had the power to do but the death rate in Washington kept rising. A resolution was pushed through Congress giving the public health service a million dollars to fight the flu. Biochemists around the country worked ceaselessly to develop a vaccine. Hundreds were produced. Then, a researcher in Massachusetts came up with the most promising solution. Hopes rose. Perhaps a cure was at hand. San Francisco's mayor wired for a huge shipment. A special envoy carried the vaccine across the country on the Fleet 20th Century Express. Soon, over 18,000 people in the city had been inoculated. But it didn't work. Suddenly, with the flu unstoppable, the booming science of medicine was in trouble. Over the previous century, it had gone from one triumph to another. Researchers had developed vaccines for many diseases, smallpox, anthrax, diphtheria, and meningitis. With the great advances in microbiology, we were eliminating mysteries, okay? The mystery of what causes this disease, the mystery of what causes this disease. The optimism of being able to visualize something, all we have to do is just look under the microscope and we'll see the organism and then take an action and see that something die off or be controlled. That leads to the thought of invincibility. 
The scientists eventually decided the flu was caused by a form of bacteria called Pfeiffer's bacillus, after the German scientist who discovered it. They, though, they made up a vaccine with the bacteria they thought was influenza. But you can't make a vaccine if you're looking at the wrong causative organism. If they were on the wrong track, influenza was caused by a virus. Science uh, knew next to nothing about viruses at this time. The optical microscopes they had couldn't show you a virus. Virus is much too small for them. Nobody would ever see virus until the electron microscope came along, and that was decades uh, after that. These poor scientists were looking for a needle in a haystack uh, when uh, they didn't know it was a needle they were looking for, and the needle was too small for them to see. So no wonder they didn't find it. Medical science, at the very moment of its great rise to power, had failed to provide a cure. The American Army Surgeon General Victor Vaughan wrote, At that moment, I decided never again to prate about the great achievements of science. The deadly influenza demonstrated the inferiority of human inventions. With science powerless, many people turned to folk remedies and quick fixes. There was some quackery that existed at the time. There were all kinds of, of gimmicks that were being pursued by people in desperation. I had careful balls in, in a little sack around my neck. I know I couldn't stand myself, let alone somebody coming near me. <laughs> I smelled so bad, I guess, in those days. We use Turpentine on sugar. We use kerosene on sugar, a few drops. You could smell this medication before you got too close to them. But it wasn't too bad because so many people had these different type medications until we were all smelling bad. Everybody was asking for medicine and there wasn't any. So Dad came home and said, we've got to make medicine some way. And so uh, in our kitchen, on our cook stove, Dad stewed up about five gallons. It wasn't real medicine, but it smelled like medicine and it tasted like medicine. And we put a lot of honey in it so that it would taste pretty good. And uh, we passed it out to everyone who wanted medicine. It went in a hurry. There wasn't much left. <laughs> it didn't do any harm. <laughs> Most of them thought it did good. Folk remedies might have been no more than a comfort, but doctors were just as useless. They absolutely didn't know what to do for treatment of these patients. The ambulances would arrive in the morning, the drivers would bring in four living patients, but the nurses would go ahead and wrap these patients in the winding sheets and they would put toe tags on the boys before they were even dead. One doctor told a patient's wife, this is my 25th case, and I've lost the first 24. A 12-year-old boy was told by his doctor, get on the waiting list for a casket. My mother called the doctor because we, the whole family was sick with this flu. And I, being an infant baby, was very sick, to the point that the doctor thought that I would not make it. And he told my mother that it wasn't necessary to feed me anymore because I wasn't going to live. Soon, tens of millions would die. In October and November 1918, the flu epidemic reached its terrible climax. In the street, there were crepes at the door. If it was a young person, they put a white crepe at the door. If it was a, 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 a middle-aged, they put a black. And if it was an elderly one, much older, they put a gray crepe at the door, signifying who died. 
so there were we were children and we was we were excited to find out who died next my father my older brother and an uncle were all engaged in the funeral directing business we lived in a funeral home the influenza epidemic uh, became so bad that the living room, the dining room, were all occupied by row upon row of caskets. The fearsome part was it that these were friends of yours that were passing away. These were whole families that you knew. These were people you went to school with or went to church with. It was very eerie, very, very eerie. The Undertaker, which was a half a block away from me, had uh, pine boxes on the sidewalk, piled high. Me and my two friends would go down there and play on the boxes. It was like climbing the pyramids, up and down and around and the whole bit jumping off. And my mother told me that I should never go down there, don't go on those boxes, because there are people in them that have died. These two friends of mine got sick right after that. And uh, so did I. My father, being the health officer, was very concerned about the Indians who were our neighbors. They were only six miles away. So Dad and the city marshal rode up there one day to see how things were going at the Indian camps. And they were horrified at what they saw. After an Indian died, his family and friends would sit around chanting him to the happy hunting grounds, and they'd sp spend all night there. And by that time, they were all exposed. Everybody had the flu. Ultimately, they killed about half of the Indians. No one was safe. In Washington, Dr. Victor Vaughan was working late trying to make sense of the chaos. He uncovered an unnerving fact. Usually, influenza kills only the weak, the very young and very old. But this time, it had a different target. People in the very prime of life, from 21 to 29, were most vulnerable of all. Vaughan wrote, This infection, like war, kills the young, vigorous, robust adults. The husky male either made a speedy and rather abrupt recovery, or was likely to die. Our experience of influenza these days, in fact, ever since 1918, has been that the virus targets elderly, with the so-called at-risk group. But in 1918, it came in with a whoosh, into the younger age group. Now that may be telling us something quite important. It could be telling us that the elderly sector of the community had already experienced this virus, maybe in 1889, when there was also a massive influenza outbreak. So could, they could have, the elderly could have experienced the virus already, and so by 1918 they had some immunity, and so they were protected. Much more than the war, the flu was devastating soldiers of all nations. 70,000 American soldiers were sick. In some units, the flu killed 80% of the men. General John Pershing made a desperate plea for reinforcements. But that would mean sending soldiers across the Atlantic on troop ships. There's nothing more crowded than a troop ship. It's just being jammed in there like sardines, and if somebody has a respiratory disease, everybody's going to get it. Sending the soldiers would be signing thousands of death warrants. But in the end, President Woodrow Wilson had no choice. The troop shipments would have to continue. 
America was not the only country to suffer from the continuing demands of the war. Soldiers were taking the flu with them all around the world. Once the outbreak gained force in Europe, then everyone else in the world realized what was going on. And of course, the, the, their idea was to try and prevent this infection from arriving on their own doorstep. And the, the Australians tried to do that by quarantining, stopping people getting off boats. The South Africans did the same, but that was not successful. You can't hold back a virus like influenza. And in South Africa, a boat with soldiers on it arrived in Cape Town. Now, wherever those young soldiers went along that railroad, along the western seaboard, they took the virus with them. And so within a week of that boat landing in South Africa, there was a classic outbreak. It's called a railway line outbreak. A quarter of a million people died. In Denver, Catherine Ann Porter seemed on the edge of death. I lay like a stone at the farthest bottom of life. The smell of death was in my own body. She was finally admitted to hospital and separated from her lieutenant. She was so sick she was left to die on a stretcher in the hallway. Her newspaper prepared to print her obituary. In New York, 851 people died of the flu in a single day. The greatest horror came to Philadelphia. In one week in October, the death rate there was 700 times higher than average. In October, we were all sick. We had headaches, pains in the legs, the stomach, vomiting and everything. We were all sleeping close to one another because we only had two beds in the one room. Harry couldn't stay with us because he was too sick. I was like a second mother to Harry. Harry was always close to me. So when he was very sick, he kept calling me all the time and I was always beside him. So my mother said, while Harry's sleeping, you go and lie down. My mother said he, he opened his eyes, his eyes went back and forth, and his head went back and forth, and he said, Annie, my name was Nanina in Italian, Nanina, Nanina, and he died with my name in his mouth. In Philadelphia, death carts roamed the city. It was like a scene from the time of the Black Death. So many people died until they were instructed to ask for wooden boxes and to put the corpse, the people, on the front porches. An open truck came through the neighborhoods and picked up the bodies. Sometimes the dead were left to lie in gutters, abandoned. Over at Potter's Field, they began to use a steam shovel to dig mass graves. Over 11,000 people would die in Philadelphia alone that October. In Illinois, William Maxwell's mother had just given birth. He was staying at his aunt's house. My only knowledge of what was going on was the telephone, which I could hear for, because my room was near the head of the stairs. And I heard my aunt say, Will, oh no. And then, if you want me to. And she came into my room and she tried to tell us what had happened, and the, the tears ran down her face, and so she didn't need to tell me. I knew that the worst that could happen had happened. My mother was marvelous, and uh, when she died, the shine went out of everything. In 31 days, the flu killed over 195,000 people in America. 
it was the deadliest month in that nation's history. Coffins were in such demand that they were often stolen. Undertakers had to place armed guards around their prized boxes. All over the country, farms and factories shut down. Orderly life began to break down. Schools and churches closed. Homeless children wandered the streets. Their parents vanished. People were actually afraid to talk to one another. It was almost like, don't breathe in my face, don't look at me and breathe in my face, because you may give me the germ that I don't want. And uh, you never knew from day to day who was going to be next on the death list. Everybody was living in deadly fear because it was so quick, so sudden, and so terrifying. It destroyed the intimacy that existed amongst people in those days of the early 20th century. An epidemic uh, erodes social cohesiveness because the source of your danger is your fellow human beings. The source of your danger is your wife, children, parents, and so on. So if an epidemic goes on long enough and the bodies start to pile up and nobody can dig graves, graves fast enough to put the people uh, into them, then you, uh, morality does start to break down. Violence broke out. In San Francisco, a health department inspector shot a man who refused to wear a mask. In Chicago, a worker shouted, I'll cure them my own way, and then cut the throats of his wife and four children. People were surrounded by traumatic death, and they didn't have any idea how far it would go? Was it gonna kill everybody? Could this be the end of the world? Is this Armageddon that the street corner ministers are preaching about? In Washington, Dr. Victor Vaughan came to a frightening conclusion. If the epidemic continues its mathematical rate of acceleration, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth. But an extraordinary thing began to happen. As mysteriously as it had come, the terror began to slip away. By early November, the flu had virtually disappeared from Boston. The toll in Washington fell below 50 a week. Even in ravaged Philadelphia, life was slowly returning to normal. Then, on November the 11th, the armistice ended the Great War. In San Francisco, the scene was surreal. 30,000 people paraded through the streets, all dancing, all singing, all wearing masks. The country had a lot to celebrate. Not only was the war over, the worst of the epidemic was passing too. In light of our knowledge of influenza and the way it works, we do understand that it probably ran out of fuel. It ran out of people who were susceptible. It's like the firestorm. It sweeps through and it has so many victims and the survivors developed immunity. For some survivors, like Catherine Ann Porter, the return of health was not the end of her suffering. While she lived, her young lieutenant lover, who had faithfully tended her, died of influenza. 
Porter wrote that the young soldier's death divided her life in two. It was one of the most terrible things that ever happened to me, that he should have died and I should have lived. He died, and it seems to me that I died then. And then when we got out again and went back to school, I was shocked to see that uh, my friends were not around. They weren't home. I would knock on their door and they would open the door just a little bit and says, no, Jimmy's not here or Frankie's not here. And uh, where is he? Let your mother tell you. They wouldn't tell me. Let your mother tell you. I was a pretty lonely kid at the time because these were my friends that I played with all those years and uh, went to school with. And uh, when I lost them, why, my whole world changed. The epidemic killed, at a very, very conservative estimate, 550,000 Americans in 10 months. That's more Americans than died in combat in all the wars of this century. Uh, and the epidemic uh, killed at least 30 million uh, in the world and infected uh, the majority of the human species. In areas in Africa, it, it would have reached the 5% of the population. And in some particular areas in the world, maybe half the population died. And I know specific examples where 80% of them died. Uh, for example, in Samoa, those islands off the northern stretch of New Zealand, uh, there the mortality was amazingly high, maybe 80% of the population died. The war killed 15 million people in four years. The flu killed at least twice that number in six months. And still today, nobody knows where the flu virus comes from. There are two ideas, basically. One idea is that they come from other human beings, that these viruses recycle, that eventually the, the 1918 one might come back again. The 1889 one might return. You see, that, so it's recycling from human to human. The other idea, probably the one with more scientific support, is that these new influenza viruses, these new pandemic strains, are already out there in the world, in the ecosystem. They are sitting in birds or pigs, and they're waiting their chance to leap the species barrier and get across into a human. In Britain, 250,000 died. In India, 12 million. But despite its toll, the 1918 flu has become almost forgotten. Why? You know, why wasn't that part of our memory or of our uh, history? And I think it's probably because it was so awful while it was happening, so frightening, that People just got rid of the memory, but it always lingers there as a kind of an uneasiness. If it happened once before, what's to say it's not going to happen again? The more we find out about influenza virus, the more real that fear becomes. A flu epidemic could strike again anytime. But at least with modern antiviral drugs, it should never again kill on the scale which deprived so many millions of their loved ones. I remember my mother putting a white sheet, a white piece of cloth over his face, and they closed the casket. I can't forget. It was very, very bad. The effect of my mother's death was that I realized for the first time and forever that we were not safe. We were not beyond harm. My father did what he could. Uh, he kept us together as a family. But from that time on, there was a sadness uh, which had not existed before. There was a deep down sadness that never quite went away. 
because uh, I knew people aren't safe. <laughs> Nobody is safe. He was the First World War's greatest air ace, but who exactly killed the Red Baron? Secret History reveals all next Saturday at five past eight. Starting shortly over on More 4, Prince Andrew, the Fergie years. Here on Channel 4, when the children's loyalty is to their mother, life is tough for her replacement. Julia Roberts is the stepmom. Next. It started with an...